Um, hello. We are still in the morning session, if you believe it, if, in spite of the fact that a lot has happened already. I know it feels like we are at the end of the day, but we are not. We are just before lunchtime. And um, it is my pleasure to introduce you to the next panel, which is going to be about um, local authorities and subnational actors um, partnering with others for um, in the water energy nexus, and um, this panel is going to be chaired by Barbara Anton, who is the water specialist in ICLEI, which is the local authorities for sustainability. I don't know whether I said it properly, maybe you can improve it otherwise. Okay, and uh, Barbara is, has a very long track record in, in water management, and it is my pleasure, and thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Josefina, for kicking this off. Um, we are now talking about local authorities, so we are looking at one of the institutions and what they can contribute to making the water and energy nexus happening. I have to say I ran into a very similar issue than as Jack Moss in preparing this session, because when I first said, yes, yes, Josefina, I'm coming, I thought, oh, yes, well, there's many good examples of local authorities and local stakeholders uh, that are working on this world energy nexus. I'll certainly find something. I put a colleague on the job to do a little bit of research and so on. But it was not that easy altogether. So when introducing now my panelists, I have to say in the first place that I'm very lucky to be with this conference exactly in this place in Zaragoza, <laughs> which has one of the role models, uh, or which is one of the role models for this particular interaction on the water and energy nexus that is uh, uh, based on a, a very interesting collaboration of the local authority with numerous actors in the same place. So with me on stage, I have from the host city, Xavier Selma who is director of the Department for Environment and Development in the Municipal Council of Zaragoza. And a very close collaborator with him, Victor Vinales, who is from a local NGO called ECODESH. And I will tell you a little bit about the case in Zaragoza, but I will need them to go more into the detail and uh, give you, you know, the real uh, necessary little bits and pieces that are important for you to know, to understand what's going on in Zaragoza here. Also with me on stage, I have Alice, Alice Bau Bauman. She is president of the Women for Water Partnership. And I have with me Mr. Hongpeng Li, who is coming from Yun... Nesca. Nesca. <laughs> the I have put it all in front of me. I might as well read it off. The UN Economic and Social Commission for Asia and Pacific. So as you can see, there's quite a mix of people and they will represent very different cases between urban cases and more rural cases between a developed, a developed country context and a developing country context. Now, looking at, at the local level, I thought that I should make a little bit of a detour um, and first look a little bit of what it means, this the, the nexus at the urban level, so not necessarily only water energy, but also talk a little bit in the introductory slides about the urban nexus. Let me see how do I move on. So what I intend to do is to, to give you an, an introduction with my presentation, and I will make reference to all the three cases that we have here on, uh, um, along the table. Um, 
we have strictly followed Josefina's rules and we have not allowed them to bring any presentations. They have a few additional maybe uh, supporting graphical material if there is a reason in the discussion to explain things a little bit better. Otherwise, um, we will really make it a talk shop here. Um, we will engage in a conversation after my presentation, but then also bring you in um, for further insights and perspectives from your side. And we uh, hope that we do not only have something for you to learn from us, but also the other way around, that we are get going out of this session with some further inspiration and insights into the case of local authorities and their role in the nexus. So, I'm going through some remarks on the urban nexus, focusing on the water side of things. This has to do with the fact that I'm actually coming more from the water arena. Um, then, also briefly hinting at, um, so if we want the nexus to work, what is actually, what are the more practical implications in terms of, of management at local level? of urban management, but also uh, local management in a, a rural context. And then we are going through these three examples. So the, the urban nexus. Now I'm really looking at a situation of a, of a bigger city and um, lots of resources are going in and out of these urban areas every day. So in a way, there's always, of course, the attempt of, of manage a city and there's a, a big institution in place to do so. But still, things are also happening in a chaotic way. Not everything can follow very orderly mechanisms because there are so many actors at the same time. And also the institution in charge, the local authority, can only do so much to keep hold things together, to make things work, to coordinate and all the rest. So in a way, you have a continuous extraction and processing of resources. Um, you have a lot of uncoordinated measures and, and, and investments, myriads of whole households doing different things um, that you know, contradict each other, that maybe make a bigger impact in some cases, whatever is happening. You have enterprises, institutions all following their own agendas and, and objectives and needs. Um, at the same time, you know, in, in that scale of an urban context, lots of different technologies in place, um, lots of ways to, to approach things and so on. So in the development of a city and, and, and the attempt to manage a city, um, the, the lots of, say, um, clusters of work had to be accomplished, but they often happen then in uh, special departments and special segments of different actors in, in the city, but in particular also in the local authority. So there's a, a certain disintegration happening while the cities came into being and well the time after that developing, um, meeting the needs that have appeared and emerged over time. So you have different jurisdictions, departments, you have service silos, you have legal categories and so on and so on. Not all the time the person in the one department knowing what the other is doing and all the rest. So this is why also uh, opportunities of these linkages that might be there are not always really uh, discovered and, and people are not always aware that they could make more with existing resources, whether they are natural resources, financial resources, whether there is time, whether this um, is um, yeah, capacity, institutional capacity, that they could do more because people are sitting in the different um, departments, mandates, tasks. So let me just make a little bit of a detour to the um, notion of, of the development of water management. This is actually a graphical presentation of how water management evolved over time and there's lots of aspects to it. I would just like to focus on, on one single aspect and this is how the different 
components of water management sort of evolved over time. I mean, first of all, when cities first came into being, there was, of course, uh, the, the main need to bring water to the city. So to feed the people, also for some maybe small industry, um, production of things, to keep the city clean and so on. So this was sort of the first uh, service that an authority in charge of a city would try to, to accomplish and provide. Then while uh, development was, was going on, it was clear, well, we, only, we cannot only bring water into the city, we also have to make sure that the dirty water is getting out of the city, is being removed from the city. So while maybe there was a certain level of water supply already in place and, and certain mechanism to make it happen, uh, a second uh, task, a second service came on top of it, which was making sure that the dirty water gets out of the city. Then in the first de development of water management in the widest sense, um, there was also an issue that the city had to be protected from water, from too much water. So in addition to that drinking water and getting dirty water out of the city, there were now more and more activities to make sure that um, you know, after heavy rain flows or after a river that might be running through a city uh, is um, sending its water you know, into the ways and houses and so on and so on, um, this is being managed in some way. So, and further on, uh, water also became um, yeah, a, a larger issue and um, it was also recognized that uh, it, is a, it has an amenity value that people like to be near water courses if they are well kept. And now in the, in the long term vision we are really looking at a water sensitive city where all these different components are combined and um, also are all coordinated with each other and we are working towards a water sensitive city if you like. Um, that can provide all these services, but also use. Oops. Hmm. Why I'm going back? Sorry. Why does this come here? All right. It's some other thing has slipped in between. Good. What I want to say with this, even within one sector only, I have not mentioned energy in just not even in one sentence. There is already a lot of internal linkages, like the, in the urban water cycle. And in many cities, even this part of the nexus, if I may say so, has not yet been fully achieved. So there is still a lot of effort uh, in many cities and a lot of effort from the side of research and, and consultants and politicians and what have you to make an integrated approach to urban water management happening. So we are starting from a situation where we are looking at the nexus between water and energy, while even, if you like, nexus issues within water itself, within the water cycle, the different components, the different objectives we have with managing water are not yet fully solved. And this is talking about water now sitting in a local authority and having to manage an entire city okay, I have to look at my water cycle. This is, I know this is already very difficult. There's lots of um, conflicts of water uses. Um, there, whatever, I have to look at it in a systems approach. What I do at this point in my water management has an implication on another point. So I'm struggling with this. It takes a lot of effort to get this in place, while at the same time, the local authorities has lots of other tasks to handle. Again, also many of them connected with water. And out of all these different connections, I mean, this can have to do with my land use management. This can have to do with urban biodiversity, with air quality, with, with the ecosystems in the urban area, and so on and so on. So to, for each of them, you could talk about a nexus. And of course, we can talk about two at the same time, but we can talk about three energy, water, food is often connected, but then, 
you know, you could draw linkages in many ways. So what I want to say, this, while we are focusing in, zooming in now on the water energy business, we have to recognize at the same time that there are many other interlinkages that also come into the play. And a, a city has to manage its entire area, has to serve the needs of its citizen, citizens in many ways. And we have to see it in the broader context of local sustainability. There are cities that are making really major efforts in trying an integrated approach that tries to incorporate as many different uh, components of um, urban life in, in one uh, in, in their planning structures. I mean, I'm just uh, taking here one example from, from Stockholm, a new residential area that was developed um, on a brownfield. Um, it's close to completion. I think it has sort of a 15 years time span and, sh and should be in two or three years it should be completed and people would live there. Um, so you can already see here, this is water, this is energy, this is also waste trying to keep um, closed loop uh, cycles and, and uh, seeing whether waste coming from the different systems can be you know, reused for other purposes again in the same closed loops. A second development of that kind is already underway. So especially in new settlements, it's of course easier to um, incorporate such principles of making the nexus work, if you like, of uh, integrated uh, approaches. So I'm trying to think, sitting in that city hall in, in the middle of a, uh, this is a, a vision of a, a water sensitive city in the future, trying to depict water in all its dimensions and also making some links to the energy part. You see, for example, you know, the sludge from, from the wastewater can be used in a bioreactor, um, but very much focusing now on the water side of things. So how does this water energy discussion resonate on a local authority? Um, we have, as, as ICLE, which is a network of uh, close to a thousand local governments all around the world, and with uh, approximately 200 in, in Europe, we have been preaching integrated approaches for a long time. Is there, do we have to change our message? Is there something new now with this water and energy debate that has now heated up in the last um, couple of years because it's clear for, for um, recognizing or, or if you want to pay attention to these interdependencies on all sectors of urban life, um, internally you will have to make certain provisions that the institution of the local authority itself has open doors between the different departments, that there is cross-departmental planning and implementation. And it also externally to the local authority, if you want to make things work, you know, and take advantage of these connections, you will have to link up with many different actors in your city. Um, not only those that are actually managing the water, but also so those that are using the water. And this is at different levels. This is not only even only in your urban area. This also is then beyond uh, into the city region and maybe you have to link up to, with watershed authorities and so on. So this all confirms once again, there is a very strong need for an integrated and participatory planning and management approach. Maybe there could be a question, so what's new now? Does a local authority who might have recognized now that, or maybe already for a couple of years, and we have seen many really very convincing cases also on our own conferences, how integrated planning and management can happen. So what's new now 
that the water and energy nexus has become so prominent and so loud in our debates also in urban uh, management. So I guess as far as I can see it, it has a lot to do, of course, with the mounting pressure now that is on our resources with growing population and with dwindling resources at the same time. Climate change also adds to it, so there's a higher sense of urgency that we have to deal with it. Um, and that we have, to, we have to be much more conscious on and more proactive on identifying the linkages between uh, the different, you know, uh, areas of resource management in, in the city. And we have to be more targeted in cross-optimizing the use of such resources. Of course, we also know more. There's been more research, so we, which facilitates obviously such kind of action. And, and there's more, or there's uh, new technologies also that can help uh, to make it happen. And this is one of my learning points with which I would like to go home and a generic question to the audience, which you just may want to keep in mind at this point, you know, talking from a point of this integrated and participatory planning, do you see there's special ingredients now in the debate that are very important to convey to local authorities and that are more than what I have sensed so far. Maybe you want to make a mental note on that and we come back to this issue later. So just briefly, strategic approach for a cyclical nexus management to reintegrate the potentially disintegrated uh, functions in a city. I'm saying a cyclical approach, of course, in particular in this area, there will have to be a lot of evaluation and monitoring because it's all relatively new or, or yeah, the specific and newly discovered linkages and nexus issues uh, will still need a good deal of attention in terms of whether managing them in a new way will really deliver what we think it should deliver. Um, so what is needed now is really not only coordinating, for example, water and energy at the same time that they do not contradict each other, but even more so that we find exactly where the intersections are between the two sectors um, and assessing more systematically what the potential is of these different intersections uh, to make these efficiency gains that we are out for or to benefit in terms of sustainable, more sustainable development. So, um, and then for each of these linkages that we identify, there's probably a number of different technology solutions or, or other uh, approaches or other solutions that um, would be potentially suitable for taking advantage of such uh, um, interlinkages yeah, and making informed decisions of what the best option would be. As I'm saying, monitoring and evaluation will be particularly important now and um, it also becomes clear because this is so complex and there might be so many different angles to watch at the same time that a strategic involvement of your stakeholders at any moment of this management process is certainly um, a, an advantage. So now we are coming to the examples. And as I was pointing out beforehand, we have one example that is probably now closer to my introduction because it's a real urban context. So this would be Saragossa and of course also being in a developed country context, that's, that's one thing to keep in mind and this, this will make actions potentially different to when we are going as we are doing in the other two cases to Tanzania and Indonesia looking at a much smaller scale and at local authorities um, working in under very, very different circumstances and also having some other priorities. So, in Saragossa, I was trying and to, to figure out what is the special point for the case of Saragossa, what 
um, I mean, Saragossa has a long tradition of water saving campaigns and activities and I think most of you have heard about it, know about it and it's just the very place to come to when it comes to uh, you know, meeting people from a local authority and a very dedicated NGO at the same time um, that have lots of experience and tried out a whole range of different approaches to um, work with different people in, and institutions in the city to make a difference in water consumption and, and yeah, improve water saving. So I think what is very special about the Saragossa case too is that nowadays after what is it, like more than nearly 15 years, nearly 20 years maybe of um, campaigning in the direction of water saving. Um, water saving is now somehow part of the culture in this city. It's not just something that is prescribed. It's not just something that, oh my God, now these are coming, these people are coming again with their ideas of um, how I install better taps in my house. It is a part of the civic pride of this city. So people now want to do it. Um, it's, it doesn't need so much prompting anymore. And I think this is an achievement. If we could achieve this you know, on a, on a larger range, that would be really big. And I hope many local authorities will be ready to copy some of these activities and approaches. So just very briefly, um, what is this about Saragossa? So it's an ongoing, it's a major initiative with very many different facets. Um, it started uh, before the year 2000 and was initially kicked off by the municipality and an NGO called ECODES, which is the, how do you call it, Network Foundation for Ecology and Development. And we have representatives from both institutions here on stage. This is, there was a lot of involvement with different institutions, people and all the rest. And now just uh, recently there was a, another organization built with key stakeholders, which is called CINE. And if this is Spanish, Zaragoza, Innova, Enagua, Energia, something like that. I think that's easy to translate. Um, so, and, and this is really looking at both water and energy saving measures and facilitates a group of stakeholders to make this happen. It's not only the institutions, it's also the individual people that were addressed a lot with these um, activities and involved in these activities. And we have really, really uh, uh, convincing and, and um, good results coming out of this. We have, while the population is growing and since, 2000 by, since the year 2000 by approximately 100,000 inhabitants, we have at the same time uh, a reduction of water consumption in the city by uh, approximately 26%. The domestic water consumption per capita has, has dropped and uh, is approximately 40% below the average in Spain. And as I indicated before, water has become a matter of pride, part of the local culture. How could it happen? It's a multifaceted approach. There's a lot of campaigning and, and a lot has been done on the governance side, but it's also about technologies. And it's also about um, introducing bylaws and all the rest. So it's, it's a very comprehensive approach. Um, it has been very much focusing and uh, or very much in the recognition that if you want to make such uh, significant changes in your city, you need indeed the involvement of all key players. It is uh, relying on champions and I think we have champions here at the table. It needs to be facilitated all the time. It's not just the odd workshop here and there. It needs trust. We have heard this before. We may want to come back and find out how you managed to get this trust. But also, it was very concrete at some stages, like um, there are these citizens' commitments, for example. So really, citizens sign up a piece of paper to say, I am part of this process. I am contributing with my own personal efforts to, to make uh, uh, progress in, in water saving. And also then with a lot of social groups, a lot of 
local NGOs involved, again, very formally signing a commitment. At the same time, you always have to keep, you have to feedback, you have to inform people all the time, listen, this is, this is happening, we have achieved uh, another milestone, or um, we have become better, we have, uh, the water consumption has dropped another liter per day, whatever. And I think all of this is also based on a, on a big common dream and, and uh, on a common vision which, you know, puts, I guess, the frame around it and, yeah, makes people really happy to be part of this big process. So this, for example, is a group of people, I think, if I got it properly, it's from the first hundred um, groups or institutions that have signed a commitment to be part of this uh, water saving uh, initiative and I think both of you are somewhere on this picture can be found because you have been involved in this for many years now. So what's next? Um, more we want to Oh, in Saragossa, people, these linkages between water and energy have to be emphasized even more, more to be done. Um, the housing sector is meant to be pulled in a little bit further into the actions. Um, climate change has to be investigated now and its potential in, in, to, to, to play a role in this campaign. Um, there's also intentions to work together with partners in, in South and Central America to, you know, encourage them to replicate, of course, adapting approaches to, to their circumstances. And I have to say there's also very uh, uh, interesting um, new technology that has been tested in, in the building area. Um, not sure, maybe we have the time to say a few words about this. So it's also about technology, it's not only about people, it's not only about citizens, um, it's a really big picture of many angles that have been approached in, in Saragossa. Before I'm running through the other cases, Xavier, Victor, have I forgotten anything important or do you think that is enough for now to uh, give a first picture on what you're doing in Saragossa? I'm coming back with more specific questions later. Okay, for now? It's a perfect speech. It's perfect. Oh, that's too bad. Then we don't have anything to talk about. <laughs> okay, so now, completely different. We are going into a developing country context uh, in, in, in a rural situation. Again, what is the second example that we want to interrogate a little bit further uh, stand for. Now here it's a lot about, it's, it's about a 5P partnership standing for a pro-poor public-private partnership and there's a whole issue of how to engage, do you engage the private sector into delivering services for the poor if there's no really major business profit to be made. And this has to do a lot with a number of actors sharing risks. So maybe we want to keep this case in mind in particular for its potential for the, this 5P approach to share the risks that are connected with providing services to those that are not so much able to pay and will most likely not um, give you the kind of benefit that or profit that you would like to achieve in other circumstances. So in a nutshell, it's about um, the installation of a mini hydropower project in a rural context. We are talking here about a pro-poor PPP, uh, which was established for sustainable electricity supply. And it's also embedded into a wider context of not only just providing energy, but also you know, looking at improving uh, the quality of life of the people that have been served. You see here, this is just a, a brief uh, or one image of this, of the magnitude of the size of this hydro power plant, which is really small. Um, it has led to some other uh, improvements also in the um, provision of water in the area. Maybe Hongpeng, you might be able to explain a little bit better later. 
So why, how did that work? One thing, what, what were the crucial factors for success? One thing, certainly we need the local community on board to understand what their needs are. And in, in many cases, and also here, it was obviously the fact that these uh, community-based organizations also had the role of champions. The, um, maybe this is also something that needs to be explained a little bit better later, but I think one of the important ingredients was also to exp um, convince the local authority that it has to look or the other actors also, that it's more about the service output, so what do you get at the end of the story, uh, rather than focusing too much on the input in the first place. So to meet the needs, and there's many ways to meet these needs at a, in a local situation, but um, how to arrange this has to be locally tailored. And this idea of sharing the risks, I explained this before. So you can see in the, the way in which the local communities were, were involved, who were really, um, you know, invited to share their concerns and, and their ideas and their needs. And they are also now working together to actually share the benefits of it, and this is something that I leave to you to, to explain in more detail. So, where do we go next? Of course, this has been an activity in just one place, in Sintamekkar, in Indonesia, and there's now an issue of scaling up. What do you need? You need a, a bigger framework for this, of uh, the right policies and institutional mechanisms. And it's still a matter of building the awareness of the different actors also that this can happen, that this kind of partnerships are possible. And this would put the right frame for replication and scaling up. Hong Peng, anything that I said wrongly or anything that should be added right now to make people better understood, understand what we are talking about yeah, for now? Okay. Go ahead. okay. And finally, we are going to an even more remote place, Matine village um, in Tanzania. Um, again, first question, what does this case stand for? What is special about it? What is the point that we want to make it uh, with it? And here it's a matter of focusing on, on the local ac authorities as crucial actors for actually making sure that an activity uh, or the, the provision of services, for example, becomes uh, uh, locally relevant and, and tailor-made. And we'll see how this happened in this case. So just to give you an impression how remote this, this village is. Actually, it's, it's a number of villages, I understand. It's not just, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so really far away from any major grids or, you know, not being able to benefit from a close by, maybe urban area where lots of services are taking place. Um, but with a lot of, a number of after a number of years of work, um, a lot of really encouraging outcomes. Like you see, um, in 2006, we had this very typical situation that uh, mainly women, or maybe only women, had to go far away to bring the water from a far away source to the village. While now there are water services in place within the villages. Um, you can see how women have organized themselves. Um, they had a very simple building in the beginning to, to meet and discuss between them, while now they have a quite a sophisticated uh, um, building where they hold community meetings and which has a lot more uh, sophistic uh, uh, much better facilities. Um, but of course, with the development in the water arena and better water supply, there's also then other issues coming up and the energy demand is also rising. So crucial factors of success in this case, women have been the key actors that made the difference for achieving ecologically sound community development. It was important um, that they found the readiness of local authorities to work in partnership with them and with the civil society uh, at large. And the local authorities play the role of enablers um, of national development aspirations. So implementation is happening on the ground 
um, and this yeah, is probably always the case, whether it's a bigger city or a smaller place like here. Way forward, of course, uh, this all started with uh, providing water, but with the increasing consumption, lifestyle increases, and this also has an implication on, on energy demand. So, and it also means that local authorities need to be capacitated better to play the role that they have to play to make it happen and to, um, to be the right companions together with the civil society uh, to put things into place. Last slide, overall conclusions, very initial, very much from my own perspective at this point, and I hope the list will be longer at the end of this session. Um, we really have to make sure that we are not staring too much only on the technological solutions. It's just one side of the coins. We have to make sure that we now there is, I would nearly say, a little bit of a hype focusing in on the water and the energy nexus, but we have to always um, also recognize that there's many other linkages to be kept in mind at the same time. In developing, in particular in a developing country context, I think we can make major progress or more progress if we link this water energy nexus much more to local priorities and also to development priorities, including poverty alleviation, health issues and all the rest. And if we want to involve local actors successfully, we have to embed this, this kind of initiatives uh, into a broader vision of uh, improving quality of life. So not single it out, uh, but bring it back and link it to the other issues. All right, I would like to stop here and checking the time, I have already overridden it. And I would like now to get a little bit more detail, and I have some questions. We had some interaction beforehand. I've read some of their materials, but obviously uh, I'm not a specialist on these cases. And um, I would like to understand a little bit better of how all of this worked and also in how far the municipality itself had a particular role to play. So, just see. Um, maybe I would want to start with the city of Saragossa, from which I lost my questions. Now I have them. What would be interesting to know? Now, the, we have a Xavier from the municipality. We have Victor from Ekadesh sitting here. When you first started this initiative, who, who, is, who was the main player? Who kicked it all off? Were there, was it always a very harmonious partnership or were there conflicts at certain stages? Who is more important of the two? Well, thank you very much, Angela. I think uh, you did a very nice synthesized exposition, exhibition on this presentation, pardon me. I'm going to try to answer this. This is, all this is a process, um, and we have to uh, have a vision at the time we start in that. And that starts at the strategic planning of uh, Zaragoza City for 2010. And at the time, uh, some committees were created, and uh, logically, we took advantage of the situation to approach uh, environmental uh, issues. And the committee devoted to environment at the first, uh, for the first time um, is a city committee, not an ecology group, so to speak, <clears throat> where all the stakeholders are represented. So we had a first document, a first draft, and uh, where we said as for the 2010, uh, uh, we wanted to uh, decrease the use of, we had the usage, usage of water on 65 hectares. And that will uh, be, yeah, a stack of uh, cubic um, hectometers, uh, pardon me. And 
Therefore, we have that situation and we have the uh, dossier attached to it. And of course, uh, an opportunity occasion for our city. Uh, and uh, we always put under the situation where we need to transfer water to other regions. And we have this uh, opportunity to be an example if uh, we could transfer that uh, practice that good practice uh, to uh, apply it to other cities as well. Then we had a local proposal on this uh, on uh, water, and this was a, a public process, a little bit wider. And this type of process, um, uh, this will force us to have a co-management uh, together with the. Uh, politic uh, will, because otherwise we, we will not have anything else to do, and also involve as well the civil part of it, and that um, have us uh, done, a, uh, have us create a consensus uh, together the uh, politic uh, and the civil part of it, uh, civil part of the city, uh, together with the trade and uh, was together with the unions. So uh, we work with the uh, municipality and its organizations. We try to follow the same guidelines. Uh, we try to respect each other and be autonomous at the same time. We try to avoid conflicts and everyone had its own competences. Um, along all the process. And uh, in order to finish uh, this answer, uh, the process had different elements. First of all, we cannot, we cannot ask the citizens to save water if uh, uh, the institution itself uh, doesn't invest uh, some money on this. So the mayor uh, lately asked, uh, how much did we spend on water? And I answer, well, around 100 million on infrastructure and utilities, and also around 40 and 30 indirect millions. I told you around 100 millions, but we're talking about 130 or 140. But what we didn't say is that six to seven million euro were devoted to information sensitivity uh, of information to the citizens about the, uh, wa the water and awareness programs. And also uh, uh, the works, the real works that were needed uh, for that. Then we, need to, we needed to approach the pricing, the, um, in which case we did not want to collect money. Uh, just to cover the costs of the service. And uh, at the same time, um, there were kind of uh, a deterrence for the biggest consumers and also interest for those that were saving water. And uh, so that citizens that, sh that proved that during two years uh, proved uh, actually that had saved water um, the city hall or, or the city council will uh, return the money, at least the 10%. Um, also, we involve the University of Zaragoza on this. So uh, we had some teams uh, uh, researching on this type of taxes that might be applied later on. Uh, so we were working on public workings works. Pardon me. Then. Uh, taxes or somehow a tariff to be applied to it. And together, all together, uh, tried to, uh, it was drafted in a municipality uh, by law. Uh, um, also considering the type of toilets, the type of pipes, the sizes. And uh, on the other hand as well, it is a law or a um, regulation that uh, is mandatory for the city hall as well and uh, also for the citizens. So we are all committed to all these issues that were uh, appro uh, approached. It's, uh,
relationship with the municipality? Was it always so easy with Xavier and his colleagues? Or were there times of trouble where you wanted more from the municipality that they wanted to put into the process? What was important to make this partnership work? Uh, my, uh, good morning. My first sentence is uh, congratulations, Josefina Maestu and the team for this conference. My second reflection is uh, maybe the Spanish speaker participants prefer I speak in Spanish. And maybe the English speaker participants prefer listen the wonderful translation. So I continue in Spanish. No? Um, in, in this relation, no? uh, in the relation, in, la rela oh, in this relation, uh, local authorities uh, uh, or NGOs, a very important subject is that uh, we need to understand why and f what for. Uh, sometimes we speak about, we talk about how, but if I'm not really convinced on um, the fact that I have to cooperate with the city hall or the uh, private sector, I mean the company, the private company, I'm not going to do that. If I am really arrogant on that aspect, and um, I think that I can do it all by myself, which is a thing that is shared by everybody, uh, then I'm not going to cooperate with anybody. Is, uh, this is to say that in order to collaborate and cooperate, we need to be humble, humble enough. Alone, we cannot build any sustainable future for this planet, nor for our cities. Uh, we need uh, to create a massive change, wide enough and fast, that requires to change laws or regulations, technologies, and also change the culture. And many times, nor local, uh, pardon me, public authorities, companies, nor NGOs understand why or what for this cooperation is needed, and therefore this is not uh, taking place. In Zaragoza, fortunately, this was understood, and this is very important. Uh, it is very important, uh, so to speak, <laughs> just to create a little bit of a conspiracy of uh, accomplices pushing uh, for this idea. Uh, enthusiasm comes from Greek, which means uh, you are possessed by the gods. So if there are not uh, people uh, there is not people that is uh, enthusiastic, then this is not going to go anywhere. So therefore, it's very important to create this very nice uh, net of people participating on it. I think, Barbara, you commented on it before. You were talking about 16 years of relations. 16 years of relationship is not a, it's not flirting. It's not a... a night alone flirting is more called loved or a marriage. So if we really want to transform the reality, it requires a cooperation on a long run. And uh, as we said, we have several projects, European projects and another ones, but everything in a long, in a long way of cooperation. We cannot change things on a fast way. And from my standpoint, uh, I think it's complicated and we've worked a lot on water and some, a little bit on energy, but not that much establishing those connections. And I think um, that would be a good learning point uh, for these last years, that we need to create a metaphor for this work, for these links, and uh, trying to use this metaphor that is being used in many restaurants is a gastronomic restaurant, which is a restaurant on a zero kilometer, which means that the food that they work with uh, do not uh, go beyond 100 kilometers away from that restaurant. Uh, they, they use them from uh, the local areas. Um, uh, I think we can apply the same concept uh, to water and energy. It shouldn't be uh, uh, the water energy shouldn't be used uh, from uh, points farther away than more than uh, 100 or 200 kilometers. 
as I say, we need a collective dream. Uh, we need to have that cooperation, a common idea, and therefore we use those metaphors. Another uh, aspect um, that I uh, uh, that was pointed out in the other panel, uh, the energy uh, and the energy uh, is subject to central government regulations and the water normal uh, is subject to local regulations. Sometimes there are some places where uh, the tariff is being um, uh, changed, but at the same time they don't have that saving because not everybody uh, can see that difference in savings. So we need to see how to establish that connection and sometimes it's uh, institutional cooperation. And another uh, matter I want to, s to mention is that um, in that process there have been changes, uh, simple ones, uh, those that needed some evolution, like telling people please close the top when you're brushing your teeth or change the top. And those are normal changes. And in the year 2014, 7,000 million people, and as for myself, I have the, I am aware uh, that uh, creating that little evolution uh, changes, uh, uh, we're not going to make an impact on the climate change. But we need a deeper change. And because otherwise we will need to uh, go from the uh, owner economy who has a drill, an electric drill these days in the, in the house. In the United States there's like 50 million drills and the average life, useful life of that drill is like 13 minutes. Uh, with that type of uh, splurge in general, uh, we cannot uh, have a sustainable development. So we have to do something with a shared economy. Maybe we should think about questions on bigger washer, washing machines uh, in the buildings, like uh, uh, shared washing machines. Well, Josefina is telling me uh, to uh, hurry up and close. So I'm just going to say one more thing that uh, also um, we're seeing that in Spain we talk about environment, water, energy and a green economy as well. But we not only need a green economy but also more inclusive and more responsible. Now in Spain there's 4 million people that are living in a situation of uh, energy poverty. Therefore, we need to uh, approach that these projects or linkage between uh, water and energy observe the social aspect of it. Barbara was talking uh, very generously about Zaragoza, about a developed city, but we have four million people in a situation of energy poverty which is a concept from the uh, green economy we need to approach uh, to uh, carry out these economies. Your further um, insights into, into the initiative. Um, I guess there are a couple of questions, but maybe I would like to, to give the word and also look at the rural situations now before we are going to the audience and they might have further uh, uh, questions to you or comments. Um, in Sinta Mekar, um, we have this idea of this 5P partnership and I think we, before we go into any further on that, we should have a little bit of a better understanding of how this actually works. Um, if you like, I can put up that one slide. I think that shows the structure. Does it help you or will you just talk like... Uh, that would be good. Uh, yeah, I think you had a quite good uh, summary about uh, the project itself. But uh, regarding the 5P, I think a proposed public-private partnership, I just want, want to emphasize, actually PPP is not new, but the proposed PPP, especially for the small scale uh, energy and the water project is quite uh, new. And also there are a lot of challenges. Uh, if you just put this on the screen, you can see 
uh, when we start this project, actually, it based on the energy access and try to uh, promote uh, the energy access with the locally available renewable energy resources. This is a small hydro. Uh, at the same time, uh, it will improve uh, the conditions for the irrigation and also uh, water and the sanitation in the community. Uh, people probably question about, uh, you know, how the private sector can get involved because most of the private sector is uh, profit oriented. How can you just uh, get your profit, uh, put your investment in this uh, poverty elevation project? But that is uh, also depend on the, the market uh, segmentation. Actually, we just uh, divided this uh, market by uh, three components. If you look at uh, the top of this uh, uh, market for the, I think this is mainly for rural electrification and also it's uh, applied for other uh, energy access uh, project. Uh, if you look at the top, actually it's uh, uh, purely, we call it purely commercial. So that is a kind of uh, uh, if the private sector or the government or any of the entities you want to provide these energy services, you can just uh, get uh, uh, your rate of re uh, your uh, investment return in a certain period because this is uh, uh, like the usual uh, practice to extend uh, like the, uh, the grid and also to provide uh, the commercial energy services for those community uh, which you can get your investment back in a certain period. And the only thing you need here is uh, you know, you need some kind of uh, government uh, policies and to regulate the market. But then at the bottom, if you look at the bottom of the market, it's actually purely, we saw it, purely social. This is uh, like those community, uh, even this is not community, it's probably individual household, which is gathered in different, uh, 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 like mountaineers areas, so it's very <coughs> difficult. To, to extend any of the power grid to those areas mm -hmm. and also very difficult to put the investment there to get any economic activities to pay back for the investment. So we think this is the market, uh, the uh, this is the segment uh, which government should pay 100% of the investment uh, without uh, expectation of the, any kind of return. It's purely social benefit for the local people. I think the government should take the full responsibility to provide uh, this kind of energy and water serv services to those uh, components. And then in the middle, actually, this is a place, if there's a, a appropriate kind of mechanism from the government to support the private sector, you will see uh, the partnership is established and then there's a potential you get your investment back uh, with, with this kind of uh, risk sharing mechanism. That's also I want to emphasize uh, why we call this partnership is uh, really good to private sector because you will see the public sector, the local government, the community, and also the uh, NGOs to join together to minimize the, the risks. I think one of the risks for the private sector is uh, access to financing, reliable financing, to invest in energy access and the water access project. So for this one, actually we discussed with the local government, with the central government. Uh, I think uh, one of the advantage we have is because the village is already covered by the national grid. So, but the, the issue is uh, the community, they still have about 100 households. They cannot afford to pay for the connections. So that means uh, with this project, we can provide a kind of uh, income resources to support the poor families to connect to the grid and to get the energy services. So that's exactly uh, like uh, uh, ASCAP, we facilitate the government, the uh, power company, and the local community and private sector to set up this partnership and to get to the power purchase agreement. They sell the electricity to the grid, at the same time they use the revenue to support the poor families. And also, after they connect all the poor families, the revenue will be used to support the income generating activities. That is to improve the affordability of those poor families. 
And then this was already done uh, in 2007, uh, 2006. Uh, the project is in, uh, in operation. After almost five, six years, uh, they already connected all the uh, poor families, and also the revenue is used to support uh, the infrastructures in this community uh, for uh, like uh, health and uh, uh, water and uh, 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 sanitation, and also at the same time uh, even for the education. This uh, uh, supports some of the, of the family which uh, cannot afford to send their kids to school. So this is really the combination of the economic and also uh, the energy services, the economic benefits, and also the social benefits for the community. Thanks, Hong Peng. I think that makes everybody understand the case a little bit better. Could you maybe also shed a little bit of light what the role of the local authorities or district authorities in this uh, project were different maybe to the other actors? Yeah, I think uh, you already made a good point. Uh, during this uh, process, what is the role of the local authority? And I think the point you made is uh, you change the, concept, uh, the, the perception you know, from service input to the service output. So that means you have to emphasize what your customers, like uh, your clients need, the support, what kind of uh, uh, like, uh, demand from the market. That's exactly like uh, I mentioned first, they need the, uh, the poor families, they need uh, access to energy service, the basic energy services, and also basic water and sanitation services. So the government here, they understand this, and then they try to find a way, because most of the developing country, the government budget is quite limited. So they cannot, uh, you know, to do all these kind of things uh, uh, everywhere. So they have to find a way to supplement the limited government budget. So this is a way they just uh, provide this kind of uh, like output-oriented service and to the private sector, to the community, and then to find a way how this uh, output service could be uh, like uh, accepted and uh, could be implemented. So this is exactly the model here. Uh, the local uh, the local authorities they just facilitate this and also they provide support to build the private sector and the power company to meet each other to negotiate the power purchase agreement to get the project uh, 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 constant revenue to uh, improve the sustainability of this project at the same time to use the revenue to support the local communities Thanks. Okay. so let us move from Asia to Africa. Alice, um, you were telling me it's a difference working with women uh, for the water and energy nexus. Can you explain that a little bit better? What is this difference? Um, yes, why women? Well, I want to start by... ...comenzar diciendo que eh, no eh, hablamos solamente de personas particulares, tú, tú o yo, o solamente mujeres, perdón. Uh, Eh, sino que las, las mujeres es un grupo grande de la sociedad civil que está organizada y tienen eh, un gran capital social. Es, eh, van a estar en la... The ...contributing to sustainable development. So, um, we use the, 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 as Women for the Partnership, we use the social capital of women and their uh, highly sophisticated organizational forms. It goes from very local to international to contribute to, to the uh, common agenda of sustainable development. Now, um, what is the specific interest? Well, uh, when Adil took us back to the, uh, the Bonn Nexus conference the other day, uh, he mentioned that uh, a very important part of the discourse was about poverty eradication. So it's about addressing the needs uh, of uh, the, the so-called bottom billion that have neither uh, water nor food nor energy security. And this is particularly the, the sort of clientele, clientele that, that Women for Water has. Our organizations in about 100 countries of the world mostly work with and for the, 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 the rural poor. And I picked this specific example to show you how remote it can be and how, um, how uh, basic it can be. Um, and I came to realize um, through this conference 
because I first thought when Josefina invited me, now this time, what is Women for the Partnership having to do with the water energy nexus? We are not about water and energy efficiency so much as well as to make sure that, that uh, the poverty is alleviated by having people having the most basic needs, in which, as you have seen in the picture, boosts enormous development. And then, of course, came the crux. It, it creates a lot of energy demand. And while we practice integrated approaches and we really, really uh, promote that, um, I came to realize that we did inefficiently look at the energy implications right from the start. And um, why is that? Because Women for the Partnership was built around the fact that the women wanted the water first. Fortunately, local groups, um, one of the advantages is, uh, of very local situations, it seems if, that we went from very complex, very sophisticated, very technical to, to very basic. In a way, that's true. On the other hand, um, it might be easier to manage at that level, but complex it's nevertheless. The good thing is that when you still are in the rural areas and with the local people, the nexus approach comes quite naturally because they are never about drinking water only or uh, only about energy. They are about sustainable livelihoods and how to address the different needs. Uh, and this is where... Um, in particular women, because they have a sustainable development approach very much, we find, at least the women in our network, the women's groups in our <laughs> network, I must say, um, we find it quite easy to, to approach it in a sort of integrated nexus manner. But we also realize now, at least I did, how easy it is to uh, leave out something which is so essential as energy and not take it on board from the start. <coughs> That's one of the lessons I have learned. Thanks, Alice. That uh, gives us a little bit of a better understanding of uh, what we are talking about here in this very special situation. Um, now, there's also the question here in how far, even in such a small place with only very few people living there, how, how their authorities came into play. In the meantime, um, I have checked through your oh, pictures yes. and given some impressions of your activities and the people you were working with uh, in this activity. Um, and there's the one that is talking about engaging local and district authorities. Is there something that you want to add on, on that specific point? Oh, yes, thank you for giving me that opportunity. Well, uh, if we look at the, the nice diagram that you gave about those different uh, interactions, um, uh, I think that Mateni is, is really on the bottom of the, of the diagram. It's so remote and uh, they would... Um, the municipality, I mean, let me show you the municipality, uh, the, the, the mayor's office here. The mayor is on the left, and at the town hall, it's just a one-room one sort of uh, premises with an earthen floor and no uh, windows and some shelves on the, on, the, on the walls, and that's it. And the community of Metheny is, is uh, close to 12,000 people with five sub-villages, so it's not as if it's, it's very small. Uh, and then you see on the right-hand side is the, 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 the facilities that the, the women of Meteni, the Tegemeo, provided for the district water engineer to come to work out with them the plans for the gravity systems. And the, the, the project that we are doing, it's close to half a million euros because of the gravity systems and the remoteness and everything. So there you are. You have a municipality that doesn't even have a proper closet and, and you have a 500,000 Euro uh, project. Um, I'm saying this because the, the local authorities there do not have the, the means nor the capacity to really address this, while it is crucial that they should. Uh, so fortunately, the local women's group has, is a partner with the Women for the Partnership, and we have been able to provide the means and the possibilities for them to engage the, the local authorities. And this was not a natural process. I want to emphasize that as well. While the women had the opportunity and they really wanted to talk about the water, initial water provisions in their, their, in their village, uh, they were not even let into the door in the be beginning stages. So they took a sort of uh, meeting with, with uh, national women's organizations in Dar es Salaam to, to gain enough confidence in order to go back to the mayor and tell them, listen, we have rights. We have come here to address the issues of our community. And we want to be heard, because you, you are in a situation where it's not natural to have, let's say, <coughs> citizens' participation 
like here in Zaragoza, and, and especially the women are not, don't have a voice. So it, it needs a bit of sort of like capacity development and mindset change to make uh, un the understanding that this participatory partnership approach is really beneficial. That the fact that your role as a municipality and as a mayor is to, to take care of your uh, citizens and make sure that they have a good living, it doesn't mean you have to do it on your own. You don't have to provide for, you can work with partners in a partnership to really um, um, work together, not as sophisticated as, as Victor pointed it out, but it's the same system. And this change in mindset has created a really functional partnership in this very, very remote village, including with the district of Sama, where they have to go uh, walk for, for a day and then take the bus in order to even reach the district. So that's the type of, of, of situations you are in. The role of the local authority is crucial because they are the sort of like the, the spider in the web and it's their role to address the needs in the community so also to make the, the community participate and engage and take seriously their own commitment to contribute. So basically, I do not want to repeat that whole process because it has been pictured so eloquently in the city of Zaragoza. The principle in Metveni is exactly the same. Only we have to provide as a community the opportunities for the people to really play out their role. And I would really make a case for, in, especially in this water energy nexus, because it's as complex as it can get, that there be sufficient uh, attention for local authorities' role, whether be it cities or in between, like your case, or our very, very remote case, and uh, invest in the lower levels, not only top-down. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Alice. Um, now let us turn to our audience and see whether there are more experiences or with local authorities and partnerships or whether they want to comment or have questions to what they have heard so far. Anyone who wants to come in here? Hello. Um, I'm Alberto Guijarro from Mongagua, Ingeniería para el Desarrollo Humano, and Spanish NGO. Um, I would like to, well, I have a question uh, for the Indonesia representative. Uh, um, we have heard about the, the role of the uh, public authorities, and I would like to know some extra information about the, the role of the NGOs and the, and the role of the private sector in these partnerships. And a second part of the question is uh, from your experience, uh, what are the, the, the many elements uh, you consider uh, to, to carry out uh, the partnership uh, in a success uh, way? Thank you. Thanks for the question. Yeah, uh, uh, I think uh, th that is uh, uh, always a lot of questions. So what is the role for the mm. uh, local authorities and also private sector and the NGOs? Uh, actually, this NGO is a community-based NGO. They know exactly the local situation. So when we first uh, uh, just visit uh, uh, Indonesia, try to identify the potential sites, and uh, we didn't know what kind of uh, technology we were going to use. Actually, we just uh, identify a few potential counterparts, and we share about our objectives for this uh, kind of, uh, we, we focus on the private sector involvement for energy access, for uh, basic energy ser access and the water services. So that's exactly we got the information from the uh, community-based NGO. Actually, they are the community-based NGO, not only for energy and the water. They also help the local uh, community to improve their income activities, like they provide the technology uh, to improve uh, the daily kind of operation. And uh, to uh, rather than just only plant the rice, they also provide opportunities to do some uh, fruit, uh, like to improve the, uh, the income. But for the private sector, actually, it's also quite interesting. The private sector is a kind of a, uh, hydropower uh, company. 
they are doing a lot of hydropowers in different places, but when they learned that this is a kind of opportunity for them, they provide the technical information actually for the like a hydropower sites. They also provide their uh, like uh, own product, the like power generator. It's actually turbine from this private sector as a kind of uh, input to set up the partnership with the community. They share about, they, they actually establish a joint uh, venture they call the, with the community cooperative and the private sector. They put their money there. That's exactly what I mentioned to share the risk. It's not only the private sector, the community, they also do it. But the way is the community has no money. So that's, the, you know, from ASCAP, from the UN side, we just mobilize funding to support the community to establish the, the, the joint venture and by providing this money as a equity from the community. So that means the uh, joint venture is by the private sector and the community. So this is exactly based on the project that we made the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the policy suggestions for the government. If you really want to replicate this kind of model, the government needed to make this kind of uh, financing ready to support the, com uh, the community and also the uh, private sector. Actually, uh, we are replicating this kind of uh, model not only in Indonesia, now we are doing it in Laos and Nepal. It's, uh, the technology is depends on the local resources, but the model is exactly to bring the private sector. It's actually not uh, the big private sector because those big private sector usually they are really aim at the you know, profit, profit. At the same time, uh, unless they are doing the CSR project, usually they are not at this kind of small, look at this uh, small scale project. So that is exactly, we work with the private, the small and the medium sized private sector and try to identify the local partners to work together. Now we are doing this in Nepal and Laos. And the, I think uh, by uh, end of next year, we will have uh, several other uh, kind of projects uh, to be uh, completed and based on the local resources. So I think that's exactly the private sector role. They bring the technology, they bring the, uh, their uh, investment to the, this kind of project. Thanks. Thanks, Hong Peng. Do we have other questions or comments or other experiences? Um, in the audience that you want to share. If, if not, I would actually have a question still to the case of Casablanca, which I found actually very closely related also to what we are talking about here. Maybe if you can help out with, with language. Um, so you were working in Casablanca um, with informal settlements um, and you were providing with the whole institutional partnership, you were providing water, electricity, I think you mentioned maybe a third service, waste services. And in, in your case, we have heard now from the cases here uh, in Sindameka, in Indonesia, in uh, Metini, in Tanzania, that it was very important to work closely together with community-based organizations. So usually, even in informal settlements, you have some local organizations, residential organizations, people organize themselves in some way to defend their interests. Has there been any component in this partnership um, which also involved some sort of a local group uh, that uh, is located in these informal settlements. Uh, euh, c'est surtout euh, les euh, associations de quartier, les, alors je sais pas, les euh, leaders de quartier euh, avec lesquels euh, nous travaillons dans le cadre de l'accompagnement de, de cette clientèle spécifique euh, qui nous permettent, de, enfin, grâce à des focus groupes, euh, de sensibiliser la population 
euh, à, à, à l'arrivée du service, puisque ces populations euh, ne sont pas habituées euh, donc, euh, à, au, au service. Et donc, euh, nous nous appuyons beaucoup plus sur les, euh, surtout euh, les, 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 pour les femmes, puisque bon, il euh, y, y a beaucoup de, de, de femmes et d'enfants qui There are many women that are in charge of uh, taking water uh, from the sources. So, especially it is the women who are helping uh, normally, and this task is carried out by women normally. Yes, they have to work with community leadership. Um, sometimes it's organized, uh, sometimes it's not. Uh, very often it is uh, some woman in the district who uh, assumes the role of community leader, but it's not always a woman, but it is, it is usually somebody from, from that community who, who helps. And the company organizes itself to try to interact much more positively with those people by setting up focus groups and, and those kind of, of things. So that's his answer to the question. But I'd also like to answer the question because I have fortunately had the privilege of visiting a lot of operations of this kind run by enormous companies and run by tiny companies. Um, and the first thing I would say is that none of these companies are motivated entirely by profit. And small companies usually have to have a larger profit margin to survive than do big private companies. And public companies that want to survive sustainably over the long term also need to make a profit. It's not always called a profit, but unless there is a surplus in their op operation, they are not sustainable. So uh, we need to disconnect the emotional word from profit from the reality of providing public services. Um, and, and the third point I would like to make, um, and we see this all the time, is the fantastic uh, liberating effect in communities of having proper provision, reliable provision of these basic services. And um, it doesn't really matter whether you're talking about water, energy, sanitation, even, even transport. These local services are hugely liberating to the population and I was talking to Saeed uh, earlier on today and I've seen myself in Casablanca for example the reality of the wealth creation you can see in certain parts of Casablanca if you look from 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 on high you can see the uh, arrival of the water and sewage, sewage and electric services because you can see the habitat changing as those services arrive you can actually if you go back over several several months you can see the physical Im impact that this has on the on the urban makeup and that's the, and it, it, you have to see it to believe it but it shows how important it is to people thanks a lot there's a reply from Alice to add yes it reminds me of a very important thing that I forgot um, because I like very much your example also of the different tariffs so that the, the people pay according to their ability to pay. And if you find the, the, the community based, if you, if you have the community involvement, this must be your experience as well. They are, there is a great willingness to pay. Uh, they cannot pay for the investment, for, for the facilities to, to, to get there, to have the water and the sanitation and, and, the, and the grid. That's what they cannot pay for. But the maintenance, uh, there's nobody who says, I'm not willing to pay for the service. Uh, they, they, even if they, they have done the water user association as part of the project, so that the community is really uh, also involved. Um, and then the first thing is that they come up with the tariffs and then they set automatically the tariffs as according to the, the ability to pay. In the case of Metheny, it was like that the, there is um, four ba uh, primary schools, one, one um, secondary school and not a hospital but an infirmary. And they didn't have any access to water. And being sort of like um, not having much of, of income, they cannot afford the water at the tariff from the, coming from the, from the gravity system. 
because then they have to pay per liter. So the community, the whole of the community decided that the first, the next chunk of money would go to rainwater harvesting installations for those uh, public buildings so that they would have the water first. And part of the community waited for another year to have water. So it's, I can only second what you are saying. Okay, check, me, or, or yeah, uh, Mr. Say, maybe a, a last comment that Hello. I think we will have to close down, or are we flexible? We, we are already eating into lunchtime, but let us see, no. I, I think this is just a very um, interesting moment here, so if you have five minutes more patience, we would appreciate that. So. Um, we have, I don't have your name now in front of me, but I also see that Victor would like to, to add afterwards, so I, I can allow them. Okay, please. Well, uh, en, en plus de la péréquation tarifaire, uh, favorisant... In addition to the tariff, uh, um, there is also the possibility to give uh, the service, the access for the invest, investment. Uh, 250 euro per service and in addition there's also the inscription of the of register of every user the authorities intervene and they uh, get a benefit on on it and there are also other persons who come and they uh, share the load of the investment and they help thus the poor population. To the cross-subsidy system that there is in the basic tariff structure, um, LIDAC also has a number of arrangements and partnerships with both the, the government and the international agencies to bring in additional financing, to particularly to help with the, with the capital investment, which is, which is regularly a, a problem. Thank you, and I understand that, Victor, you have something to add to this debate. No, we, eh, estamos hablando de Briefly, I want to say that we are speaking about establishing connections between water and energy, and as they are related, the problems of both are related, we should also relate the solutions. That's okay, but when it comes to discussing here, we are discussing separately the problems of the south from the problems of the north. And I also think that we should establish a kind of nexus between the citizens of the north and the citizens of the south so that we could correct somehow the actual short sight of compassion. That is, I am only concerned about those, about my neighbors, let's say. Uh, cooperation has been reduced in 70%. Why here now? Why? Because the crisis says, hey, no, first our neighbors, first our friends. If we have this culture, if we have this uh, compassion, if we are so compassion short-sighted, we cannot solve the problems of the problem so of the planet. That means that we should have this empathy, this kind of empathy, so that we could be aware of the problems of the other, those living far away. This has enabled, um, on a longer term, this has enabled uh, countries such as France, for example, to have uh, longer term cooperation projects. And we should extend this to all cities of the world because uh, those drinking water, it is very easy to make him or her aware of the pains entailed of not having access to water and therefore we should also create these connections on a longer term and on a longer distance. Debate. And I think one can nearly say it in one sentence what the, the outcome of this uh, conversation is, namely that um, it's not, again, one of these actors that can make it happen. All actors, local authorities, civil society, uh, all kind of associations at local level, but also the private sector have all their own roles to play if uh, we want to get 
forward if we want to make progress and want to make sure that uh, we can provide water and energy services to, to everyone. Um, so thanks a lot for your attention. Thanks a lot to Alice, Xavier, Victor, and Tong Peng. And thanks a lot to Josefina to make this possible for us to talk about these issues and discuss them with you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And I do think that the, you brought a very different perspective. You know, it wasn't the, the same conversation we had when we were talking about the companies and when we were talking about the local authorities. So the issue of who we are talking about matters, I think. Okay, I'm very different from yesterday on the energy companies and the industry. So thank you. Thank you very much. So, yes, we have... Yes, we were going to have one hour and 15 minutes. Now we have one hour and five minutes. I'm going to ask you, before you go for lunch, uh, you, we have given you a little evaluation form about the, the conference, and I would like you to spend two or three minutes just giving us your thoughts about before we leave, hmm? about uh, what you think about the conference and what your proposals are. It won't take you very long. You don't have to write all of it. You can go to your places and also fill in the form. And uh, uh, that's one thing uh, that I want to announce, so I'll leave you two or three minutes.